Hi, everybody who's joining us. Welcome. We're going to get started in a few minutes. Um, grab your coffee, your tea, your water. We're excited to get started. Um, people are rolling in, and we're happy to have you here. For those of you who are streaming in, we'd love for you to just uh, type your name into the chat and maybe where you are Zooming in from. Hi, Steve from Portland, Oregon. Happy to have you here. Hi, Francois, calling in from Montana. Allison, we have Hawaii Island. Lisa, I was just on Hawaii Island last week. Thanks for joining us. San Diego, Houston, my hometown. Thanks, Trevor, for joining us. Heather from Albuquerque, New Mexico. Barbara from Seattle, happy to have everybody here. We're gonna get started in just a few minutes. Molly, call it, uh, zooming in from Mill Valley, welcome Molly. Mm -hmm. Happy World B Day. Isabel from the south of Brazil. <clears throat> Welcome, Carol from Ohio. Dave, we've worked together on Big Island. Awesome. Nice to see you, David. Um, to answer some tech questions for those of you who are just joining the Zoom, only panelists can speak, so you don't need um, to worry about muting and unmuting yourself in the webinar format. Um, we are going to encourage active participation in the chat throughout um, our webinar. Um, and we're lucky to have many from the Center for Food Safety team here supporting us, including Brenna, who runs the development team, and Maria, who helps with comms. Um, there are two ways that you guys can ask questions throughout the webinar. So if you just scroll for along the bottom menu bar of your Zoom, you'll see that there's a few different options for participating in the webinar format. There's the Q&A, which will be monitored by Brenna um, and Maria throughout the webinar. And then you can also drop questions into the chat, although depending on the liveliness of the chat, things could get lost there. So if you want, um, to have a question answered and make sure that it's tracked, make sure to do it in the Q&A function, which you can find at the bottom menu bar of the Zoom. Um, and with that, I think it's ready to get going. Welcome Johnny from Clinton, Tennessee. Um, my name is Ashley Lukens. I'm the Regional Development Director for, for the Center for Food Safety, and I am Zooming in from the North Shore of Oahu in the Ahupua'a of Pamalu. Meredith? Hi, I'm Meredith. I'm the Associate Attorney for Center for Food Safety, and I'm zooming in from San Francisco, California. Oh, Andy, you're on, you're on mute. Sometimes I sound better that way, actually, if I stay on mute. <laughs> uh, I'm Andrew Cabral, the Executive Director the Center for Food Safety, um, and I'm uh, here in Washington, D.C., in our Washington, D.C. offices, the belly of the beast. Uh, thanks, Andy. Um, hi, Alan from San Jose. We just want to welcome everybody uh, for joining us today. We have a lot planned for our hour, so hoping to get to it all. 
Um, the purpose of these webinars are really to just give our members and our donors and our supporters the opportunity to interact with and learn more um, from our staff and why we're all so individually passionate about the work that we're doing um, on a broad range of issues that get us up in the morning and get us working eight, 10, 12 hours a day. Um, I wanted to start off the webinar today by asking Andy and Meredith, um, one of the most important questions that I think all of us are asking ourselves as we navigate the climate crisis, and that's what's giving you hope. Meredith, you wanna go first? Yes, um, so I think a lot of things are giving me hope. Um, I think there's a major shift in people's understanding of how essential soil is in storing carbon, sequestering carbon, and how that can be a great tool for fighting the climate crisis. Um, but particularly since as associate attorney, I'm excited about our legal victories. So last summer we had a massive legal victory. The Ninth Circuit vacated the registration of dicamba which is a volatile toxic herbicide that you know, destroyed millions of acres of crops over the last few years. Um, and so those registrations were vacated. Farmers could no longer use that pesticide. Whereas since then we're still fighting um, to ensure that that pesticide is not used anymore. But that was a massive victory and gave me a lot of hope. Mm, thanks, Meredith. <clears throat> Andy, what's giving you hope? Well, you know, I think when we look at the situation, um, you know, and many of us have been following this for many decades, I'm sure. And by the way, thank you everybody for, for being with us today on this issue that's so important for humanity and the, the rest of the earth community and the planet itself. Um, you know, we, I think optimism is probably going too far, uh, but you can always be hopeful. You know, none of us thought the Berlin Wall was gonna come down. None of us thought Nelson Mandela would come back and be the, not just out of jail, but be the, you know, the prime minister of South Africa. And so lots of unexpected things happen. So I am hopeful and there's, several reasons, I think. Uh, one is that we have a new administration. Uh, we have an administration that actually recognizes the seriousness of the climate crisis. We have a really excellent international player in John Kerry, who's going to be the, the, the climate czar. That's, so that, you know, we coming from an administration that thought that might be a hoax, that the climate crisis might be a hoax planned by China. We're obviously a way ahead of that. Mm -hmm. The second thing is that and many of us have been fighting this for quite a while. We finally got the International Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change to recognize agriculture as a significant factor in the climate crisis. They say 30%. I think that's modest. I would probably inch it towards 40%. But that's a game changer because in prior meetings of the IPCC, agriculture was just left out. The whole food sector left out. Now they say it's about one third at least, and we think it's more of the climate crisis. Uh, the next, I think, is the incredible growth of the food movement. You know, we estimate now there's about 20 or 30 million Americans who are active in the food movement. And now that we know agriculture is playing such an important part in, in addressing the climate crisis, we know there's millions and millions of people who can be organized politically to put pressure, both state, local, and federal level to finally take real action on the climate crisis. And the fourth one is one I'm, I, I totally share with Meredith, uh, which is the unbelievable growth in the interest of soil. You know, 20 years ago, people didn't know the difference between dirt and soil. And I would not have predicted, you know, that people going to the supermarket, going to the restaurants that have any interest in soil. And that has exploded. The interest in soil everywhere among the mainstream environmentalist group, the public in general, even the USDA, remediating soil has become such a big deal. And if you, you know, please everybody watch the, the film, Kiss the Ground, if you wanna really see one of the great documentaries. And we're proud to be one of the executive producers on that film. The, the soil revolution, uh, the soil revelation has been, is definitely a sign for a sign of hope for the future. Mm. Well, that's the perfect segue, guys. Um, we're going to play a little video right now, which comes out of our Soil Solutions program. You can find that on soilsolution.org, um, and we'll drop a link in the chat. And this is a video that we made to help people understand the link between soil health and um, climate change. Soil is a living miracle. In one handful of soil, there are more organisms than there are humans on Earth. 
And we are only beginning to understand this vast network of beings right beneath our feet. We rely on healthy soil for 95% of what we eat. Yet, we take it for granted. Thousands of years of plowing, deforestation, and erosion have left our soils in dire shape. And we're accelerating the loss of this essential resource. But there's a lot more to the story. When soil is damaged, it releases carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And this has had serious consequences for the climate. Too much carbon in the atmosphere is causing the Earth to overheat. That excess carbon is also acidifying our oceans, threatening marine life. Meanwhile, there's not enough carbon where it once was, in the soil. In fact, many of the world's cultivated soils <coughs> have lost more than 50% of their original carbon stocks. But there's actually some good news. We now know how to put carbon back in the soil where it belongs. Plants capture carbon dioxide in their leaves and pump the carbon down through their roots to feed hungry microorganisms living in the soil. Now, what had been atmospheric carbon, a problem, becomes soil carbon, a solution. Practices like keeping soil covered with plants, increasing crop diversity, composting, and carefully planned grazing are proven ways to put carbon back into the soil. Carbon-rich soils act like giant sponges, absorbing water during floods and providing it to plants in times of drought. And adding carbon to soil makes the land much more productive. The French government recognizes this and is calling on all countries to join them in increasing soil carbon by 0.4% each year. If every nation were to reach this ambitious but achievable goal, we could store 75% of global annual greenhouse gas emissions, enough to make a real difference to our planet's future well-being. Of course, we still need to reduce our fossil fuel emissions, but we don't need to develop expensive or risky technologies. Instead, what we need is a lot more photosynthesis. Climate change can be overwhelming, yet there is real hope. Healthy soil can be a major sink for carbon. But this fact hasn't been well known until now. Because now we know a soil solution is right beneath our feet. Round of applause for all the great videographers and creators that helped us make that film. Again, if you'd like to watch it or share it, um, soilsolution.org is where we keep a lot of our climate focused work at Center for Food Safety. Um, Andy, I'd love for you to kick us off with the framework we're going to be using to guide our discussion today. You know, you always do a really good job at breaking things down in a comprehensible way. So how, what do you understand about climate? How do you frame it? How can you help us think about it today? Well, you know, in my own simple-minded way, the way I like to think about it is, is like a three-legged stool. And, and Michael Pollan in that film, you know, went through the three legs, but I'll just review. So if you think of it like the climate crisis is a three-legged stool, one, of course, is eliminating uh, the emission of greenhouse gases. And in the agricultural sector, that means eliminating CO2, uh, which we get through our highly mechanized industrial agriculture. We get through food miles. Everybody knows that 
you know, a thousand miles per ounce of food. I mean, think of all the fossil fuels going into the both the production and then in the transportation. So CO2 which lasts in our atmosphere for between 300 and a thousand years with putting all that radiant force, bringing the heat down. So that's one of the major things we, we need to deal with in agriculture. The second is methane. Methane is second only to CO2 as far as that radiant force heating up the earth, but it's 26 times more powerful than CO2. And where do we get our methane? Those are these terrible factory farms, which I call animal factories with these massive methane lagoons are a huge part of that crisis, the whole misuse. So we not only have this, you know, this really terrible crime of what we do to 10 billion animals a year in the industrial animal production, but also a tremendous contribution to unfortunately that methane. And then there's nitrous oxide. Nitrous oxide is a hundred times more powerful than CO2. And it lasts for hundred years in the atmosphere. And we get that through a number of things, but particularly the misuse of synthetic fertilizer, a major problem, and also the use of fumigants. Uh, for example, last year in California, uh, they used 200 million pounds of pesticides, 40 million of them were fumigants used in agriculture. And that's a huge source of, of nitrous oxide, which again, so those, I'd say though, there's more to that, but simply though, that, that is the first thing, we gotta stop that emission. Number two, we need alternative ways of growing food which don't create those greenhouse gas emissions. So we're talking about local food. We're talking about CSAs. We're talking about organic. Uh, we're talking about that doesn't use these pesticides. Uh, we're talking about small appropriate scale farms. Um, and we're talking about biodiversity. So that means, hey, that we can do a whole, we can feed the country easily, but without emitting these greenhouse gases. And the third leg and the one that we were, that Michael was talking about and that we were talking about and Meredith was talking about is and it's often ignored is what are we going to do with all the carbon that's out there even if we even if we stop it what about all the stuff that's out there for the, all these hundreds of thousands of years and that's where soil comes in so reforestation and remediation of soil that uh, point four if we could just do that we would actually draw down a huge amount of the carbon so soil is the solution but it's really important to remember what that film showed us it's got to be photosynthesis that brings it into the plant goes down the plant into the roots and all those soil microbes are what's critical. That's where it's stored in the soil organic matter, SOM it's called, that's where it's all stored. If our pesticides, we kill those, all that sequestering, all that solution to climate will be lost. And uh, that's another reason to fight those pesticides so hard and to go for soil remediation. So those are the three, stop the emission, find alternatives that don't emit those gases and then use our best solution, the soil solution, as, along with reforestation and massively increasing the photosynthesis in our tree canopies as the solution to the problem. A beautiful solution too, by the way. Mm, thanks, Andy. So let's drill in a little bit to our first leg of the stool, which is reducing greenhouse gases. Meredith, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about some of the CFS lawsuits that are helping reduce the emission of greenhouse gases. Yes, yeah, so CFS works in three major areas that I see as reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so firstly, our organic and beyond program uh, and our animal factory program and our pesticide program. Um, so regarding our animal factory program, you know, animal factories are one of the huge, biggest emitters in the agricultural sector for greenhouse gases. Um, they emit methane and nitrous oxide from these huge manure lagoons. Um, it's absolutely horrific for climate, the climate crisis. Uh, it also emits, you know, pollution into communities, harms public health, contributes to antibiotic resistance. And so a few years ago, um, CFS helped shut down a huge CAFO in, on the big island in Hawaii. And so that, let me find my notes on that. Um, so for years, this CAFO on the big island was emitting and polluting everything around it. Um, and a huge community groups came to us and we worked with these community groups to get that huge CAFO shut down. Um, and that was in 2019. And that was one of our major victories. And then beyond that, more recently, uh, the Trump administration, you know, tried to withdraw the organic livestock rule, which was a rule, you know, for the welfare of animals. Um, it required more space with animals for organics. Um, basically, withdrawing that rule made it a lot easier for there to be organic CAFOs. And so we went in and we filed a lawsuit um, against that withdrawal of that rule for those animal welfare standards. 
And we, you know, we did that under the Administrative Procedure Act and we continue to fight um, with that lawsuit currently. And then also with our organic and beyond program, as Andy was saying, you know, nitrous oxide is a huge greenhouse gas contributor to climate change. Um, it's way more potent than carbon dioxide. And that is coming from these synthetic fertilizers that are being applied on the soil. And it's, it's also coming from the production of those synthetic fertilizers and the, from the transportation of the synthetic fertilizers. And so CFS has been fighting to, to keep organic standards really strong. Uh, and one way we've been doing that is we had a recent lawsuit um, regarding hydroponic production. And so maybe this gets into the next leg of the three-legged stool because we're really, we're working on, you know, building the soil, building that soil organic matter and making sure that soils are really healthy in these organic production um, farms. And so CFS, we were approached by you know, several farmers who were having to compete with hydroponic producers. And these farmers were using organic methods for growing, um, which are include composting, they include crop rotation, they include cover cropping. These are mandatory practices under the Organic Foods Production Act. And so these farmers are using those practices. They have, uh, you know, organic, they have environmental welfare in their organic plan. They have all of these methods in their organic plan and they're being out competed by these hydroponic producers. And so we represented them. Uh, we filed a petition to the USDA into the National Organic Program to stop, you know, allowing hydroponics in organics. And we represented these farmers. Uh, a lot of them are berry farmers because a, a lot of berries are produced hydroponically. Um, and unfortunately, the district court uh, said that USDA's denial of the petition was not arbitrary and capricious under the Administrative Procedure Act. But we continue to comment to the National Organic Program. And actually, two days ago, we filed an appeal on that lawsuit. And so we're continuing to work to make sure that organic keeps soil as the center and as the focal point. Thanks, Meredith. Um, Andy, I'm wondering if you can hone in a little bit on the methane question, because it feels like uh, reducing methane emissions is pretty critical to the fight against climate change. And it helps definitively link the industrial food system to climate. What are we doing to reduce methane in the atmosphere and how does our work address that? Oh, you're on mute. The, uh, you know, from about 1997 to 2007, we did see, actually see a leveling off of methane. In uh, the last 13, 14 years, it skyrocketed again. Um, and, you know, these massive uh, um, dairy factories, 15, 20,000, 25,000 cows, and all these animal factories that we're seeing are, are, are a huge factor in that. So while we filed our lawsuits, along with our colleagues on uh, fighting ag gag laws, for example, around the country, where they've tried to make it criminal for people to go into these animal factories and show what's going on, the, the cruelty and what's going on in those factories, and along with our colleagues, and uh, we've been able to stop a number of those. But I think it's also important for each of us to take responsibility. So we have a program so opt out of industrial meat you can see it on our website uh you know each of us i mean that's what makes the food movement so exciting for me is that tomorrow you can make decisions they're going to have big effects we can't always decide whether our taxes are going to go into a war we don't agree with or are going to go in, into a nuclear power plant or be god forbid uh, uh, insurance coverage for gmos or something but we can vote with our dollars we can vote with our choices and say no to industrial meat no the answer is no, maybe no to meat altogether, but we need to significantly reduce our meat and we need to make sure that the meat that we do eat is humane and organic. So opt out of industrial meat is important. And it's not just important for the environment and for the climate crisis, but I would argue it's also morally important. You know, we, each of us, even though it's systemic out there, the cruelty to these 10 billion animals, each of us bears a responsibility to do something about the climate crisis. So we can opt out of industrial meat, we can eat less dairy, and we can then continue to knock off these dairy capos because we've also done one in Washington state. We've gone after them in Oregon. And, uh, and one of the reasons we're able to do that is that these huge capos were taking their toxic waste, right? And spreading it on farmland as if it was legitimate agronomic waste. Well, along with a wonderful lawyer called Charlie Tebbett who we've been working on these cases with, we came up with a precedent saying, hey, 
can't do that. This is not normal agronomy. This is not some kind of soil improvement. This is contaminating the soil, contaminating the aquifers and the water sources beneath it. And we won case after case, setting up an enormous precedent that these uh, dairy factories are going to have to actually dispose of their waste as hazardous waste, which is very important, but also very expensive for them. So some have even gone out of business. So it's a great precedent to knock off these huge sources of methane. And again, remembering that methane is second only to CO2 and that it's, it's, only, it's short lived in the atmosphere, only about 10 years. But during that time, has 26 times the radiant power of bringing heat back to the earth. So can we use animals? Absolutely. Are they a really important part in a rotational, relational farming system? You bet. But not industrial. Not the industrial is a disaster for the, for the animals, for, the, for our human health, and certainly for the climate crisis. So there is no excuse for that particular industry to be on earth. Thanks, Andy. It's really helpful. I know we just hosted an a in-person event. Wow in Hawaii and we screened Kiss the Ground in some of our Regenerating Paradise videos that we'll show later um, in this webinar today. But one question that continues to come up and it feels like we're really trying to nuance is what role does meat production play in a climate future? Um, and so what I'm hearing from you is small scale, relational, regenerative, but there is no space for concentrated animal feeding operations or CAFOs. Um, if we want to solve the cl climate crisis. Right, folks, um, folks are eating meat, it's still eating meat, cut your meat uh, intake in half, make sure it's organic, humanely raised, and say no to industrial meat. Uh, mm. and, uh, and you know that's, a, that's again, a, a, a way to deal with uh, the climate crisis and the moral Here. crisis. Of what we do. Meredith, I'm wondering if you can just very briefly talk about the methane work that we're doing in California. Yeah, so in California, we are, you know, supporting incentives to help farmers transition to reduce their methane production. Um, and also, we don't support methane digesters. We see that as sort of a band-aid to this problem, which is the industrial scale of these CAFOs and, you know, the cruelty that comes with that, the pollution that comes with that. And so we don't support that as a band-aid. Um, and I would also add that on the federal level, we are working with other groups and we're part of a legal petition right now for the federal government to regulate methane under the Clean Air Act. Um, since 2005, there's been an agreement that all of these major industrial players, these major CAFOs, have not needed to comply with the Clean Air Act, the Federal Clean Air Act, one of our most important environmental laws. Um, they've gotten sort of free pass. They haven't, it hasn't been enforced against them. And so for almost, you know, what, 16 years now, they haven't had to, you know, reduce their emissions under that act. And so we are, you know, looking at legal angles to try to fix that issue. And right now we're part of a petition to regulate methane um, as a pollutant. Awesome. Thanks, Meredith. I'd like to go to our next leg of the stool. So we've talked a little bit about how Center for Food Safety's work is addressing the need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and we've talked about how both our lawsuits and our educational and policy work um, helps advance that reduction. And so now we're gonna transition over to the next leg of the school, stool. And the next leg of the stool is alternative practices. If we can't grow our food or produce meat in a way that doesn't negatively affect climate change, how are we gonna transition our food system to climate friendly practices? And Andy, I'd love for you to get us started. Um, can you tell us a little bit about some of the legal and policy actions that we've been taking to en encourage alternatives to industrial uh, agriculture? Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> I keep on doing that. I will learn, I will learn. Um, yeah, Center for Safety was actually started in 1997 in order to defend the organic standards that were then being formed, the federal regulations that were that, that were being formed as, after the passage of the Organic Food Production Act. And uh, they were going to allow genetic engineering, uh, they were going to allow sewage sludge, they were going to allow uh, irradiation, all as acceptable organic practices. So we at that time started the Center for Safety to stop that and there were 60 other four, 64 other points of darkness. So defending organic has been really at the core of what we do. And our idea, idea is to defend the integrity of the standards, but to evolve the ethic. And as Meredith was saying, we call that our organic and beyond sort of, it's, it's, it's more than just a campaign, it's really a mission. And what we mean by that is that organic, we think organic should be the floor of all American agriculture. 
absolutely the floor, right? And so therefore no pesticides, no GMOs, you name it, uh, no irradiation. But above that floor, that's just the floor, it's not the ceiling. We wanna build a future of food that is local, that's appropriate scale, that's humane, that's socially just, and it's bi biodiverse, all right? So local, appropriate scale, humane, socially just, biodiverse. And if we do that, it will be climate friendly because local means we get rid of those food miles, right? Appropriate scale means we won't need the mechanization, no more CO2, none of the pesticides destroying the soil microbes. That's, so that will give us what we need, the organic and beyond future that we've been uh, promoting. And it takes lots of time and effort, lots of bandwidth to defend those standards because a lot of big actors, big industrial actors have joined organic now and they would much rather change organic to fit what they're doing than change what they're doing to fit organic. So it's a constant struggle for us to keep the organic beachhead there and then build that, th that or organic and beyond future, uh, food future that we're all, and I'm sure everyone listening is, has been fighting for. So that, and, and now we've added this wonderful organic regenerative to this, this coming together now of the organic and moving forward again with the ethic, knowing that the that soil is absolutely critical. So we want to have organic that really does a great job in regenerating. You know, we can't keep extracting nutrients from soil. We can't keep extracting uh, fish from the sea, can't clear cut you. You can only extract in nature so much as it can regenerate. If you, if you extract nature at a greater rate than it can regenerate, that is a recipe for extinction. That's a, that's the recipe for, for planetary death. So, re, you know, organic regenerative to me is one of the most exciting things that's come around the last few years because it really gets to the key. We've got to move from an extractive economy to a regenerative economy, an extractive agriculture to a regenerative agriculture. So organic and regenerative is that future. Meredith, I'm wondering from a legal perspective, like help people tune in to what it means to protect and monitor the organic standards. How does our legal team track what's happening um, and how the industry is trying to erode these standards? Yes, well, the Organic Foods Production Act created this very interesting sort of board, which has all kinds of actors in the organic community, the National Organic Standards Board, which has producers, you know, people that own farms, interested consumers, um, and they allow for a lot of feedback. And so they'll, you know, they'll say what they're going to discuss at a meeting. They have a meeting twice a year. Uh, it's usually several days long. And so those topics will be presented to the public and CFS is always following those topics, always checking those topics. And so we'll comment and we'll say, you know, for example, wild caught fish shouldn't be organic. We don't know what's going into that fish. We all know what it's eating. We don't know what's happening out in the ocean to produce it. Also, we don't want overfishing. It's a you know, finite resource. Um, and so we'll, we'll see that on the list and we'll come up with something to say about that, you know, according to our policies and we'll participate in those meetings, we'll make oral comments. Um, in addition to that, as I was saying before about hydroponics, um, we make rule making petitions to the National Organic Program. And so those rule making petitions are either you know, accepted or denied. And then those can be the basis of a lawsuit um, to continue to help us improve those organic standards. I think, you know, something I want to emphasize to our attendees is just how in the weeds this legal team can get to ensure that the industry doesn't get their way in these closed door sessions, that all of us are too busy and not wonky enough to understand what's going on. And that's one of the things we wanted to bring to life through this webinar series. Yeah, that's right, in the weeds, is that th this work isn't always sexy. We're not always able to be at the front of a courtroom defending community groups, although we absolutely do do that. A lot of our work happens in the minutia of administrative meetings behind closed doors that all of us are too busy to attend. But our legal team is there day after day monitoring to ensure that if rules are going to change, they're going to change in ways that benefit the public health and our planet. Andy? Yep, oh, mute. Meredith mentioned a couple of cases. And I just want to quickly mention about three years ago, without any notice and comment, uh, the National Organic Program um, decided that it was okay to use contaminated compost in organic production. No comment, they just overnight, it's okay, folks, you can take, take stuff out of 
chicken CAFOs, take stuff other CAFOs and use that manure, just use it in organics. It's all fine, nice and easy. Saves you money from having real compost, right? So we litigated and the Organic Trade Association opposed us, actually had a declaration opposing this because they, for these big guys, hey, we want to use all that. Well, we won and, and now contaminated uh, compost is not allowed in organic. Think of all those toxins that would have gone into organic. Think of what it would have done to people's understanding of organic integrity. So yeah, it, it, it sounds wonky, but it's incredibly important work that we do in defending organic and evolving the ethic. Remember, defend the standards and evolve the ethic. That's, that, that's sort of our mantra. I want to allow you guys just one more comment about how our work is helping to move the food system towards alternative and climate friendly friendly practices. And then I'm going to tune into one of our uh, videos, which which highlights the educational work we're doing in this area. Any final comments, Meredith? Um, I mean, I think I just, I already discussed our case on hydroponics and just our work on ensuring that soil remains central. Um, it was, you know, part of the founding organic movement to have soil as the focal point of organic farming. And so we've just been working on ensuring that, you know, soil is continuing to be improved, that soil organic matter is, you know, continuing to be fed into by organic producers um, to help fight the climate crisis. Andy? Yeah, I, I really want to bring in our, I really want to bring in our work on, on pesticides here. Um, you know, uh, Rachel Carson, 50 plus years ago, um, said that we really shouldn't call them pesticides. We should call them biocides. Pesticide makes it sound like the only thing they kill are pests. Uh, that's not true. Uh, you know, whether it be a herbicide or an insect, they kill animals, they kill humans, and that would, they also kill these microbiota, the, 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 these microbes in the soil, our bacteria, our fungi, they devastate them. And that's what's creating, as I said, as Michael Pollan said, and I said, and, we, and Meredith and I are saying, that is actually where that sequestration of the carbon is. That's the future. That's what's going to address this crisis, right? So by getting rid of those pesticides, which we spend a huge amount of our time doing, saying goodbye to dicamba, saying no to uh, a dual enlist, saying no to, uh, we right in the middle of a big lawsuit right now, very, we just got an admission out of EPA that they had not looked at the environmental impacts of glyphosate, of Roundup, and when they reapproved it. And now they're going back to the court saying, oh, sorry, we didn't do our homework. Well, you know, we know from numerous studies, not only, you know, the human impacts of Roundup, but also the extraordinary impacts on, on soil microbes, devastating. Uh, and by the way, also devastating on frogs, devastating on bees. Again, don't think of them as pesticides. We shouldn't use those terms, they're biocides. And one of the most terrible things about these biocides in relationship to climate consciousness is the devastation of that gorgeous life in that soil that we need so much for our future and the future of the planet. So that's how our work on pesticides plays deeply into dealing with the climate crisis. Thanks, Sandy. Um, I'd like to share a little bit about the Soil Solution and Regenerating Paradise program because I think it's playing one role in opening up people's imaginations to what a climate friendly food system can look like. So I'm gonna play just one video from that eight part video series um, that focuses on a composting project on the island of Oahu. Sec. Sorry, everybody. I think it's exciting. A lot of people are coming back to this idea of farming or homesteading or living off the land. I think it's primarily to answer this question of why. Like, why am I doing anything? And the answer is really clear when you're farming. There's like every single thing you do has a purpose. We knew from the beginning we were gonna have to follow the natural principles of the earth to build our soil. So we follow permaculture, um, biodynamics, natural farming, um, or you know some common sense organic farming principles. Um, but we use a mashup of all of it to do our best to build the healthiest soil foundation that we can. Soil really is the base of everything that we do. 
So this is where we do some of our food waste processing for the farm. Um, we do a lot of different stuff with the food waste. Some gets fed to worms, some gets fed to chickens, and some just goes straight into a compost pile because we process a lot of food waste. Healthy soil is like this layer that's crucial for protecting the earth. It's like our clothing, it's like our, it's our skin, it's the skin of the earth. It's a healthy balance of organic matter, clay, and all, you know, all these other things, but it's to create a home for the living organisms that live in the soil. So really healthy soil is alive. It's full of microbes. And it's those microbes that make all those important processes like photosynthesis and then also the, the, the sucking up of nutrients of the plant all happen. Hawaii is, is blessed with really good soil in a lot of places. Not everywhere has it been taken care of properly. Um, monoculture agriculture, plantation style agriculture has stripped nutrients from the land and left it polluted with poisonous residue. Uh, but we have an opportunity to clean that up and we can do that through regenerative practices, um, adding compost, adding organic matter, adding the biology that works to clean that up. So yeah, we have an opportunity to build our soil health and improve our ecosystem by having more regenerative farms. So one of the reasons why that video series has been so impactful here in Hawaii is because it has opened up a new conversation about the role of agriculture in mitigating climate change. And I'm really happy to share that the Center for Food Safety um, wrote and passed a bill which created one of the U.S.'s first uh, carbon farming task forces, which is now the Greenhouse Gas Sequestration Task Force, which is bringing together stakeholders from across the food system to figure out what role the government can play in incentivizing uh, climate-friendly soil practices. And so we're identifying producers across the state that are helping to reduce our carbon load and bring us to our carbon neutrality goals. Um, and so what that's looked like is that over the past two years of the task force convening, the state has actually invested money in doing a soil carbon baseline study for all the soils across the state so that we can begin to track and measure our progress towards climate neutrality. And we've also identified agricultural operations that might be able to participate in a program that would further financially incentivize uh, farmers to take on soil regenerating practices and get compensated in some form. So this is how education tracks to our policy work. Um, so that we're changing the consciousness, but also actively changing the rules of the game and the programs that support those rules so that carbon friendly farming is easier for everyone involved. Andy, I'd love to turn it over to you for our final portion of the presentation, which is again, how we're working to get carbon out of the atmosphere. Yeah, I think, you know, to, I don't think I need to remind anybody who's listening the urgency of the task ahead of us. Um, we know, for example, that photosynthesis, that alchemical process, is actually the basis for sequestering carbon in the soil. It's got to start, everything starts with photosynthesis. But over about 100 degrees, and certainly over 104 degrees, photosynthesis stops. So everything we'll we're talking about would stop, right? So the task is urgent. And, you know, awareness is absolutely critical. Uh, we need to, you know, awareness is the first step. We need to educate in our schools. We need to educate our families, our communities. We need to educate to make people aware of how much our food production system contributes to this catastrophe. And then we need to resolve it in each one of those three-legged stools we talked about. We got to stop emitting. We have to have at least neutral alternatives. And then we need to use our reforestation, remediation of soil as the solution. It's there. We just got to make a lot more people aware of it, a lot more people, the urgent, you know, the importance of this. And, I, and two quick things on that. You know, people say, well, maybe people don't want to sacrifice. Well, I say, you know, think of the sacrifices we've made in this COVID crisis, not traveling, not seeing people, 
no environmentalist is asking people to make anything close to those sacrifices to deal with this crisis on which our future and the future of the planet rests. So, and the other thing I wanna point out is that an argument you're gonna hear is that through your work, sounds great, but how are we gonna feed the planet? And I just wanna note that 60% of our farmland right now, our best cropland is devoted to the growth of GMO corn and GMO soy, which creates all the problems that Meredith, you Ashley, Meredith and I have been talking about, right? Doesn't feed anybody. That's not even corn we eat. That's corn that goes into these animal factories and goes into cars, and goes to high fructose corn syrup and some exports. Soy, the same thing, goes into these chicken factories, goes into soy lecithin and goes into automobiles. Doesn't feed anybody, 60%. So the real way to feed you know, this country and the world is not to think about yield of crops that are the amount of yield of crops that aren't feeding anybody to think of nutrition per acre, not yield per acre. What's the nutrition per acre? That's agribusiness. We're interested in getting agriculture back. And if we get the culture of agriculture back, it'll be the culture of soil, seed diversity, which we're gonna need in the climate crisis world, farmer friendly, not the poisonings and the suicides we've seen. We're gonna take each element of our agriculture, which is soil and water, and air and seeds and farmers and sun and pollinators and animals and bring them back into a relationship. And that is not only gonna heal our agricultural system, it will actually address the climate crisis. So we have the solution ahead of us. We just, and we know the urgency. So it's about education, changing policies, finding litigation and showing the way to go in the future as, we, as you have doing so beautifully with these uh, reforce, uh, agroforestation and agroecology films from Hawaii. So. Yeah, awareness and action. Change the consciousness, stop the bleeding. Thanks, Andy. Meredith, would you like to comment on some of the work that the Legal Eagles are doing to help encourage uh, healthy soil? Yeah, um, so I think going off of that, you know, Monsanto has been kind of catching the wind of this idea of soil as a carbon sink. You know, Monsanto's like, well, our herbicides don't require people to till because, you know, tilling can, can contribute to some carbon being released into the atmosphere. Um, but, you know, CFS, we see that as it's just part of this huge industrial agricultural system. You know, we've got, first we have the Roundup Ready crop system, which, you know, had the active ingredient glyphosate. Now we have this dicamba crop system. And so we've been fighting these crop systems. Um, you know, dicamba was an answer to the Roundup Ready crop system. That system created these super weeds that, you know, farmers couldn't, couldn't destroy with Roundup anymore. And so Monsanto's like, oh, we have a solution for that. We have our dicamba system. Well, that system went through, destroyed millions of acres of crops, um, you know, harmed species, you know, harmed people's health, destroyed the social fabric of communities, created this sort of almost monopoly where farmers felt that they had to defensively plant dicamba resistant seeds so that they wouldn't get hit by their neighbor's dicamba and have their crops ruined. Um, all of that, it's also destroying the soil. It's destroying those microbiotic communities in the soil that are sequestering carbon. And so we've been fighting these two crop systems, this glyphosate Roundup Ready crop system and the dicamba system. And as I mentioned at the beginning, last summer we had a huge victory. The Ninth Circuit vacated the EPA's registration of dicamba. Um, you know, they said that they had created these use instructions to mitigate the harms from dicamba that were impossible to follow. They could, if, in the real life conditions, they can only be followed, you know, a few hours out of the growing season. And the court found that that was, there was no substantial evidence supporting that that could actually mitigate the harms from dicamba. And that dicamba was harming communities. It was harming crops. It was harming species. Um, and so we continue to fight with that. We challenged the newer registration. EPA went back, you know, five months later, re-registered dicamba again. We're challenging that under the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Resendicide Act and under the Endangered Species Act because it's harming species and there's no substantial evidence suggesting that it's not causing adverse effects on the environment. Um, and so we just keep fighting these registrations one after the other um, until we can Thanks, move forward to better, yeah, better system. Thanks. Um, I'd love to open it up. We have about 10 more minutes and um, we've been trying our best to answer your questions in the Q&A function, uh, in the chat, and just shout out to Brenna and Maria for doing such a great job in setting up 
this webinar today. It truly takes a team effort. Shout out to Joey who runs our comms. We've got all that information out to you uh, to enable you to register. And I know we have some listeners on Facebook, Cynthia, Edith, and Isabel. Thanks so much for watching us there. And feel free, we're monitoring all of the Q&A on Facebook Live as well. Um, one question that was asked, um, which felt important, which is, what is the gr global relevance of these solutions? Um, oftentimes we think about climate work and our climate work as it relates to the US. But Andy, I'm wondering, you know, what lessons have we learned here which help address the global contributions to climate change? And then specifically, what role do you think the, the global South plays in this question? Yeah, that, that, that's a great question. Um, There's a real battle that's been going on now for decades since the supposed Green Revolution, which brought in all of these, you know, pesticides and brought in the entire mechanized pesticide industrial agriculture into a lot of so-called developing countries. And, um, you know, a lot of what we're talking about sounds revolutionary with the organic and beyond, but it's actually what indigenous communities have been doing forever and what even our own ancestors did forever. You know, pesticides are relatively recent. You know, all of these fungicides are relatively recent. All of this is relatively recent. Huge mechanized monocultures four or five generations ago, they didn't exist. So a lot of it's, we're learning a lot of science to help us go forward and learning more about soil and that's important. But a lot of it's also going back and learning. So there's, so in the so-called developing world, there's tremendous pressure in Africa, and I visited Africa and Asia for them to adopt this um, agro business approach. Don't grow food, grow GMO corn or, or, or other export crops so you can make money, so you can bring money into the country rather than actually feed your people. And that's very tempting, especially if the governments are not stable or if there's corruption. Meanwhile, there's this entire movement now uh, to reinstate ind indigenous agriculture in a lot of these areas. So it's a very dynamic process. And I think we can play a real role here in the United States showing the disastrous failure of our agriculture to protect our soil, to protect our water, to protect our farmers, to protect our seeds, to protect the air, to protect our animals, our pollinators. All of these are being devastated by our system that 60% of which doesn't even create food. If we were to export that successfully to these countries, actually, massive starvation would result. It's a disastrous system. So we can say, hey, we've seen what we've done. Don't do this and try and really push back on the propaganda of the Bayers and the Monsantos and the Dow DuPonts and Syngentas and say, we do have a new model we're using. A lot of it's an old model, some of it's a new model, but it's a very dramatic battle that's going on and with literally the fate of the planet uh, at stake. One question that came up, Andy, which I really like is the amount of government money, our money, our public tax dollars that go into supporting the industrial food system. I'm wondering how we get our public dollars and government funds out of big ag. Um, yeah, that's a very difficult problem because what happens um, both at the federal level and the state level is that the uh, agriculture committees are usually stacked with pro-industry people. They make sure that anybody on those, regardless of whether it be Democrat or Republican in this country, are pretty much pro big ag. So uh, it's a problem of education, letting people really know who these people are. But another thing is really transparency. One of the things that we're working on is we don't really know. It's really kept secret about how much of our money is going, for example, into subsidizing CAFOs. We know it's billions. We know, but they have hidden it very, very carefully. Uh, so there's a, a couple of books that have been written about it, and we are in the process of trying to come up with FOIA, trying to come up with transparency so we can actually tell the American people, did you know that your taxpayer dollars are going there to defend these chicken farms? They're going, and they're all, they keep going out of business, keep changing locations because they're polluting the water. No one wants to work at them, but they're keep getting subsidized all around the country. So there's a huge amount of investigative work that we're trying to do so that we can create awareness and anger, legitimate anger, you know, outrage, if you will, legitimate outrage, righteous anger at how much our tax rate laws are going to support these terrible this methane producing cruel industry um, that, as I said, I, it has no reason to exist actually. 
So yeah, it's it's it's. But I think awareness is going to be first because it's they're very carefully hiding. It's, they don't want you to know. They don't want us to know how much subsidies are really going in there. By the way, we're not against subsidies here at CFS. It depends on who it's going to for what. We would love to see bigger subsidies for organic regenerative. We, we would like to see our government all just really go to the future and not to this zombie paradigm of industrial agriculture that's destroying everything we're talking about. So it's not that the government doesn't have a role in subsidizing uh, um, agriculture. It should have no role in subsidizing agribusiness, which is creating the climate crisis. Mm. So we're almost out of time and I wanna thank everybody for participating. Um, I wanted to close this out by doing a little go around and maybe I'll go first. Um, and that's what can we do? How can we participate? Um, and at Center for Food Safety, I wanna say first and foremost, we understand ourselves as protectors of local resilient community food systems. And if you have an issue that's happening in your community that you would like us to learn about and know about, we'd love for you to connect. I help work with the Pacific Northwest team. So we're thinking about community issues across the Pacific Northwest, Northern California, Oregon and Washington. I'd love to hear how the industrial food system is showing up in your backyard and what kind of work we can do together. Also in Hawaii, as we mentioned earlier, we helped bring a lawsuit on behalf of the community of Ookala who was seeing their freshwater streams ravaged by the wastewater of a concentrated feeding app, uh, concentrated animal feeding operation. So help connect us to the issues that you're fighting. Um, also, please donate. All of this work is funded by our members and by our amazing foundations who help support our work. And so we can drop a donation link in the chat. And then finally, participate. Participate in your governmental processes, participate in your elections, participate in watchdogging this food system. It is, our democracy is only as strong as the people who participate in it. And we need to do more than just vote. We need to be active participants across the political process. Meredith, what do you think people can do? Yeah, I mean, I agree with voting, being part of that political process, um, just being conscious and supporting local farms, um, trying to cut back on those emissions from the you know, food being shipped so far, um, you know, buying organic, just thinking, thinking about your food choices and sharing it with other people. Andy? Yeah, I, I, those are all great suggestions. Well said. Um, I do think, you know, we also have a wonderful program, a global seed exchange. And we're gonna need a lot more seed diversity in the climate crisis world. Uh, and the, you know, we've monocultured, not we, but the industrial system has monocultured 70, 80, 90% of our fruit and vegetables. So please get on our site. And if you wanna share seeds with people globally and, and really save seeds, please do that. And again, please opt out of industrial meat, just say no. And to the extent you can say no to GMOs and say yes to organic. You can vote with your dollar every day for the new food future. Thank you again, everybody, for joining, for participating so actively in the chat. We so appreciate you coming in. We're going to be hosting another one of these webinars in the fall. We'd love to see you there. Um, and we're happy to continue answering questions after the webinar. You can email us at office at centerforfoodsafety.org. Extra snaps again to Brenna and Maria, who are always on deck during these webinars, dropping links in the chat and making sure you guys are really connected to the resources that we're highlighting in the conversation. I'm also open to receiving your emails if you have any other questions and comments, alukens at centerforfoodsafety.org. Um, and we look forward to continuing to share our work. We're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Uh, we have an awesome newsletter, which you can sign up for on our website, centerforfoodsafety.org. Um, Andy, Meredith, thank you so much for joining today. Thanks, Ashley, so much as always. All right, everybody have a wonderful weekend and we will connect with you soon. Stay healthy and safe, everyone. Ciao, ciao. Thank you so much.